Guys, I've really been looking forward to this one. Uh, Michael Reagan is the eldest son of former President Reagan. Um, he was, for two decades or more, a conservative uh, radio talk show host. I was delighted to have done a number of shows and segments with him. And he is now the chairman and president of the Reagan Legacy Foundation. Michael Reagan, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you. We've lost touch over the years. I think uh, we used to cross paths a lot more. Well, when I was writing the book about your dad, um, which became Reagan, how an ordinary man became an extraordinary leader. I was uh, hanging out at the Reagan Library. I, of course, through Young America's Foundation, visited the Reagan Ranch. And then I'd come on your show periodically to talk about issues. Um, and But how have you been? I, I've been great. Thank you very much. And just to let your audience know, I'm still a conservative. I'm just not a radio talk show host. <laughs> just to let people know. I don't want them to get confused that I left both of them. I, I've been great. You know, I left radio 2009. Uh, my sister Maureen, uh, when she was dying of melanoma, and we had that brother-sister talk. And she said, you know, Michael, if you get a chance, will you promise me you'll leave radio when you can afford to do that? because the legacy of our father is so important. We can't leave it to the historians. Will you please carry it? And I promised my sister about three months before she passed that I would do that. And I left radio in 2009. Wow. And you have been, in a sense, now you're devoted to um, helping promulgate uh, a better understanding of who your dad was and what he and what he stood for. I got to start with a funny line, though, that has been attributed to you. And I'm, I'm going to have to see if this is true. <laughs> um, um, the, the line is has to do with Reaganomics. And someone came up to you, evidently, according to the story, and said to you something like, they were trying to explain Reaganomics to you, believe it or not. And you apparently <laughs> said something like, don't talk to me about Reaganomics. I've been living under it all my life. Did you actually oh, say absolutely. that? <laughs> absolutely. That's exactly what I said. I tell people, you know, I used to ride out to the ranch with my father. Well, I always rode out to the ranch, but I would be in the right front seat of the car, eight, nine, ten years old. And he would sing to me every hymn. Marine Corps hymn, Navy, Army, Air Force, Coast Guard, and he taught me about America by singing these to me. But I remember one time I'm riding out there, and my parents only gave me a dollar a week allowance when I was a kid. And you couldn't keep up with the Hope kids and the Crosby kids and all the Beverly Hills kids on a buck a week. So I said to my dad, I need a larger allowance. And my dad, for the next 10 minutes, told me about the tax system in America. <laughs> I'm eight years old. I just tell me you're going to give me more money. And he says to me, he says, you know, the government takes 90 cents out of every dollar that I make. And with that, 10 cents is left. I have to take care of your mother, you, your sister, Maureen, my new wife, Nancy, our new daughter, Patty, the ranch, the foreman, and the horses. I felt so sorry for him driving into the ranch that day. I actually offered him back half my allowance. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he says to me, he says, when the president's elected that gives me a tax break, I'll give you a larger allowance. Well, the Kennedy tax break went into effect 1964 by Lyndon Johnson, as you know. My dad remembered what he told an eight-year-old kid and raised my allowance from $1 to 5 I lived under Reaganomics. That's that's just downright amazing. And, you know, I think as we think about uh, your dad, who was very unique in so many ways, but part of the way to understand your dad is that he was a product of the Depression and World War II. And, mm -hmm. and, and isn't it a fact that the values of the so-called greatest generation were forged in that era? Uh, the sense of frugality, the sense of deferred gratification, the sense of a certain respect that pervaded the society that came out of the unique experience of scarcity and war, didn't it? Oh, absolutely right. Of course, being born and raised in Illinois, at Tampico, Illinois, Dixon, Illinois, and those values that were instilled in him by, by his family and the people around him and, and what have you, instilled all of these things into my dad. And, and he carried it through his whole life, uh, which was amazing. And, you know, again, tried to teach it down to his children and, and, and what have you. But he was, he was so involved and so loved the people of that generation that he, he never forgot who they were. Hence the speech he gives at Point to Hawk in 1984, the boys at Point to Hawk. 
and all the speeches. If you really listen to the speeches my dad gave, he spoke to us in parables. He spoke to us in parables. Nobody speaks to us in parables today. They speak at us, to us, around us. But dad spoke in parables and then prayed to God. You understood what that he was telling you. Well, I think this may be the clue to how he won 44 states in 1980 and 49. I mean, think of the how inconceivable it would be today for anyone, Republican or Democrat, to have those kinds of margins. Uh, the other thing I think is interesting is that, you know, we hear today about how Republicans are becoming, uh, and there's some truth to this, increasingly the party of the working class. But mm-hmm. I think your dad had a very good feel for what life was like for the ordinary, hardworking guy. Now, do you think that he got that from his days at General Electric? Or where did your dad, it was because, you know, you know how insulated Hollywood people typically are from the rest (laughs) of the country. But your dad had a very good feeling for what it was like to work on a dock or work as a foreman or work as run a tractor. And I'm trying to get a sense of how did your dad have that common man feel throughout his career? You know, I remember telling me, you know, years ago, he said, you know, in our family, when I was raised, he said, we didn't know we were poor till the government told us we were poor. And that really think about what he said. We didn't know we were poor till the government told us we were poor, which is so much what we're living through today. He was a man who loved America from the ground up. And, and what I see, and I think what he would say to you today is the fact we forgot to love America. We have forgotten to love America. And we need to find that love for our own country again and have someone who can instill that in us if we're going to move forward. But you're right. You know, I rode out to the ranch with him, as I was telling you, for years. And we'd go out to the ranch. He wouldn't just ride horses. He'd chop wood. He'd build barns. He The house at the ranch that in, 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 you went and you've seen or the ranch everybody saw during the, the presidential years. He built most of that. All the railings around it, he built most of that. He was a builder. We need builders again. We don't have a builder anymore. And he was a great builder and tried to instill that into me and all all the kids by way of whether it be an allowance or, or what it might be. And I I thank God for that. Let's take a pause, Mike. When we come back, I want to talk more about your dad and relate some of his qualities to some of the challenges we face as a country now. Mm